Today we continue our series on no-till farming. We focus on utilizing crop rotations in a no-till operation. Sometimes Kathy Shelton spoke to one producer who says the two go hand in hand. Here in Garfield County, James Werfline has a number of crops in rotation. Brother and I are on a three crop in two years rotation, starting with a wheat crop, followed by a double crop milo or soybean. Uh, some years we might throw a few acres of sunflowers into it. Um, follow the next spring with corn or milo, or possibly we've grown cotton in the springtime, but that's kind of a rarity. So we get a, and then it goes after the corn or milo back to wheat. He says he's able to keep that up by taking advantage of the benefits of a no-till operation. With no-till, we were able to save a lot more moisture in the ground with the cover. This field doesn't show a lot of cover on it right now because of corn stalks, but uh, wheat would have a lot of mulch to it. Um, we've still got good moisture in this ground when the neighbors on the conventional till are complaining how they're dry several inches deep. Well, I've got moisture half inch below the surface here. I can kick down here, it's a little dusty right on top, but let's see, within a quarter half inch, I've got moisture. Which is quite impressive, considering that part of Oklahoma has not had a really good rain since October. But you don't have to take his word for it. You can see it for yourself by comparing no-till ground to conventional. The no-till soil definitely has more moisture, but Werfline says that's not the only difference you'll see less wind erosion and water erosion off your fields, the, uh, the fuel savings, the time savings, you have a lot more time to plant more crops or do custom work or just have time for the family. But this doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and patience. The first two to three years can be kind of a mess because when it does get wet, that ground does not absorb water yet as good. And so it can be kind of a muddy mess to work with on harvesting and planting. But after about three years, especially by five years, the soil has changed. And after 10, it's gotten better. And I've heard people that have done it for 20 or 30 years in no-till, and they say it gets better as you go to 20 and 30 years out. And after running a no-till operation for more than 10 years, Worfline hopes he'll be able to say the same when he hits the 20-year mark. So far, it seems he's on the right track. Chad, one of the most important things that producers and farmers really need to focus on is crop rotation. That's a, it's one of the keys to a good farming practice. Uh, that's correct. Um, really, uh, especially in no-till, but regardless of the tillage system, but especially no-till, crop rotation is critical uh, as far as, as long-term success. Uh, some producers may be able to get by uh, a year or two or three years on a, in a continuous system, uh, but really for long-term sustainability uh, in, in crop uh, profitability, there needs to be a, a, some kind of rotation involved. Let's start with the basics. What are the benefits of rotating crops? Uh, the, the biggest benefits is are, are breaking those pest cycles. Uh, so it breaks the, uh, the weed cycles, disease cycles, uh, and, and also insects in some cases. Uh, in our monoculture or continuous cropping systems, uh, we, we have a tremendous buildup of pest pressures. Uh, you know, in our continuous wheat systems, a classic example of that is, uh, it are the winter annual weeds. Uh, that we see ryegrass, uh, cheat, and things like that. Right. Uh, that tremendous pressure build up when we go into a continuous system. So doing uh, rotations and crop rotations can really help you eliminate some of those and break those cycles up. If I'm a producer and I'm looking to get into rotating more and maybe incorporating some alternative type crops into this system, what are some things I need to consider? Uh, really the way I like to approach crop rotation is kind of a uh, three-step three -step process. Uh, first of all, you need to set some goals. Uh, second is, is develop a plan and three is implement the plan. Uh, backing up a little bit, in setting goals, basically it can be broken down into intensity, uh, which is basically how many crops in a given year do I want to harvest. Uh, and the second part of that is uh, diversification. What kind of crops uh, do I want to grow? Uh, grasses versus broadleafs, winter versus summer. Uh, it can really be broken down into that. Um, 
intensity of a rotation I think a lot of times that we're not quite as intensive as we should be uh, in, a, in a large portion of the state we get an adequate rainfall to be three crops in two years or at least four crops in three years uh, in the in the western part of the state right. um, and granted that varies from you know a year to year depending on the rainfall um, as far as intensity goes right and as far as diversity goes is that really matter or does it a lot of it depend on what part of the state you're in and how much rainfall you're getting um, it, it does it does matter uh, you're right on it does matter where you're at in the state uh, but also it, it does it depends on if you've been a, a continuous grass or say continuous wheat for several years uh, you want to try to include include a broad leaf uh, and preferably a broadleaf summer crop uh, that gives you twice as much diversity uh, because it's easy to control those winter annual weeds with a, a summer uh, broadleaf crop. If we're looking at your second rule, what do producers need to be thinking about there? Uh, basically, the biggest things with, with with developing your plan is to identify those crops um, and make sure look at your past herbicide. Uh, the number one th issue we see when when producers start to go with a uh, w with a crop rotation uh, is herbicide. Really, herbicide past herbicide applications really hurt them. Uh, as far as uh, SUs being applied to their wheat, uh, a lot of the plant back restrictions are, are fairly long on some of those herbicides. Uh, so definitely number one is herbicide history. You need to be aware of that. Uh, second thing is, you know, maintain flexibility in, in your crop rotation. Uh, some people will get set in their rotation, uh, say uh, there'll be wheat, grain, sorghum, wheat, grain, sorghum. Uh, with our weather patterns, we just can't uh, afford to be in that, that kind of set rotation. Uh, so you need to maintain flexibility. Um, another part of that is uh, looking at residue and water use. A good rule of thumb is if you're going to plant a, a high water use uh, crop, such as corn in the state, uh, always plant that following a high residue cover because uh, the more residue you have, the, the greater conservation of soil water you're going to have, so the more, the more moisture that will be stored in your, the, in your soil profile. Give me a little example of that. Um, you, you know, you wouldn't want to, uh, I'm going to use cotton or, or soybeans as a classic example because we don't have a lot of res residue left uh, with those crops. Uh, so it may not be, depending on where you're at again and the year we have, uh, you may not want to follow corn with one of those crops because corn is a fairly high water use crop. Uh, and we don't have a lot of residue uh, left from those previous crops. Right. So things like that are important to consider because typically it's the small things uh, that make crop rotation a su uh, successful. Yeah, and, and your third rule of thumb was execute. Uh, what specifically should producers be thinking about when they go out to make these things happen? Okay, uh, well, like I, like I just indicated, it's the small things, uh, the small things that make crop rotation success. So if you're experimenting with a new crop for the first time, uh, spe uh, pay especially close attention to planning because uh, it is diff it, it is a little more difficult uh, to to set planters in no-till situations compared to conventional till. You have to deal with the residue. Uh, that's probably, uh, or that it should be uh, number one or on top of your list is paying close attention. Uh, have your herbicides lined out uh, to maintain flexibility uh, with, with future crops. Uh, and then really that biggest thing, it goes back to maintaining flexibility. Um, you know, I, I always say that rotations uh, evolve, not revolve. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're successful with a certain crop, uh, most of the time, you include that in your rotation a little more. Okay, uh, I guess just one last kind of broad overview question. In a no-till cropping situation, are there specific things that producers need to be doing when they're rotating versus if they're doing conventional till? Uh, that's a good question. Really, no. I mean, the basics are the same. Uh, you know, you may apply a, a, a few more herbicides in the fallow period, uh, but really the basics are, are the same. No-till, conventional till, th those basics of crop rotation are the same. Well, Chad, good information. Sure appreciate it, and hopefully this will help producers out there uh, put in a few more rotations. Well, thank you. And you'll have an opportunity to learn more about no-till right here on SUNUP over the next few weeks. We're doing it as a preview to this year's No-Till Oklahoma Conference. It's February 8th and 9th at the National Center for Employee Development in Norman. You can find details on our website at sunup.okstate.edu and click on Show Links or contact your local Extension office.